After leaving the Privilovs, the Delarov picked up 83 more Aleuts from the village of Atka in the Aleutian Islands. The boat was really crowded. So you line up and it takes about an hour to get where you're going, look like going up the steps and so on. The aging transport ship had a capacity of 376 passengers. Now the ship's company numbered 570 men, women, and children. Illness spread rapidly, but the government doctor on board refused to enter the Delarov's hold, where the Aleut lay sick and dying. And then um, this lady that was having a baby wanted a doctor, and there's no... She asked around, and his husband asked around to see if they could check on the baby. And they never did, and that little, poor little baby died. The priest was on there, and... Uh, used holy water and named the baby. Holy God, holy mighty, holy immortal, have mercy. And then later on, they wrapped her up in canvas and they just slid her overboard, her little body. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. That was our first casualty we had. Now and ever and the ages of ages, amen. Four o'clock in the morning, my mom uh, wake us up. Girls, girls, she said, there's trees. We never see trees before. Oh, we got so excited. Four o'clock in the morning, we got up to see the trees. But we didn't know we were going to be tired of them for two and a half years. <laughs> this was a strange new land, unlike the treeless, windswept world the Aleuts called home. But as the Delaroff put in at Funter Bay on June 24, 1942, the Aleuts looked with relief on the densely forested landscape of southeast Alaska. Being so young, I didn't know what was going on. Um, where other people were worried about being taken off the island, in a way I was happy because, you know, I didn't realize there was a war going on. And uh, when we got to Funter Bay, I, I saw my very first tree, you know. Uh, I thought there was no other place except St. Paul when I was a kid. I really did. I mean, I just thought, this is it. It was myself and the other boys when we first got here. The first thing we saw was a frog. By golly, we went hunting for a frog. <laughs> we never knew what that was, so we, we, we got, I got one. I came home all muddy. My mom looked at me and said, now what am I going to do with you, you know? <laughs> Shortly after we arrived in Funter Bay, I think the novelty wore off, and uh, we started unloading the uh, ship there. We were all unloaded on the cannery side, the old cannery that had not been operating for several years. The facilities were really uh, deplorable. Hidden by the tall, fragrant spruce was a terrible reality. The deadly conditions on the ship were more than matched by the conditions on shore. If you think any of this is fun, you should be here. The water system cannot under any condition be made usable for winter. The outdoor privies empty into the water at high tide, but the sewage still washes back out of the beach for the children to track around. All houses are gone from rot. A long-abandoned fish cannery and crumbling gold mining camp offered the only shelter. There were no, no toilets, no washrooms, no partitions between the rooms that we were put in. For privacy's sake, they put up some blankets between one family and another. For a lot of us young people, I think there were about a dozen of us, ended up in a uh, attic of a warehouse. I don't even remember where we, how we slept that night but it's probably on the floor somewhere. And that night, I saw the elder women crying, and I, I hide away and cry, and I just, I just feel hurt. My little babies, you know, they were crying. And... I said, how are we gonna live here? 
Everybody asked each other, how are we going to live here? They would live, but barely, sustained only by their powerful faith and will to survive. I'd lost my mom. Losing a mother uh, is, uh, is a traumatic uh, time. It is more traumatic, I think, if you are in strange surroundings. Some years later, uh, I became the head of that agency that was responsible for, uh, for Al Utes uh, during that evacuation period. I used to reflect on the, uh, uh, the charge of my predecessors uh, during, during the war years. And while I was not faced with uh, the uh, magnitude of problems that they were faced with, the inattention that was paid to the, to the living conditions of those evacuees, I think, is criminal. The 479 Pribilobians at Funter Bay represented more than one half of all Aleut evacuees. Technically, we were not internees, but neither were we free to leave the camps. I think some people in government believed we needed to be confined for our own good. They'll get into all kinds of scrapes, drunk. They'll be robbed, fleeced in bunco games, and the first thing, some government office will be getting calls. But there were others. They wanted to keep us in the camps so that it would be easy to round us up to take us back to the islands for seal harvesting. It is our desire to keep the native organization as intact as possible. No individual should be permitted to take his family and leave camp. If he insists on doing so, he should lose all rights and should not be allowed to return to the islands. SEAL Division Superintendent Edward C. Johnston. We were treated a little better than animals, you know, the, uh, for service to the government. Officials hadn't found the time to plan for the Aleuts' relocation, but they did find time to organize a press tour. Never before had any ship brought such a strange cargo to American shores. Lining the rails of the big transport towering over our little craft were hundreds of aborigines, men, women, and children, especially children from the North Pacific and Bering Sea outposts of the Empire. Reporter Joseph Driscoll of the New York Herald Tribune looked on as the last of the Delaroff's passengers, 83 evacuees from Atka, were loaded onto a fish scow to be taken to Killisnu an abandoned whaling village about 50 miles south. Shepherding the natives were two white teachers who had been evacuated with them. As the native children lined up in the fish-stinking scow, they sang, God Bless America, to the tune of Irving Berlin. Somehow, it was rather touching to hear the little aborigines singing their heads off before breakfast to prove that they were just as patriotic and just as Rotarian as the rest of us. I must say these little yellow-skinned barbarians were much better mannered than many children back home. When we first got here, it felt good because we had been on the boat for so long. And to breathe the fresh air, smell the trees and the roses, I did know at that time that eventually I would not like the trees. But it was nice to be ashore. and. We saw this kind of an open field, so the kids were running all of us, and they were saying, ouch, ouch, here we ran into nettles, and we didn't know what they were, left blisters on our legs, you know. <laughs> the Atkins arrived at Killisnoo, equipped with the accumulated knowledge of 9,000 years of survival. But this environment was completely alien. We were kind of lost, because, uh, Back home, we had routine. There were certain things we had to do to survive. Here, they kind of dumped us. Nobody told us what we needed to do. I mean, we knew we had to do something, but what? The last of the evacuees from the villages of Onalaska, Akutan, Nikolski, Kashiga, Makushan, and Bjorka arrived in southeast Alaska later that summer. 
taken to Wrangell Institute, a boarding school for native children. Villagers were quartered in wooden floored tents. Doctors inoculated the Aleuts against typhoid and smallpox, but other medical measures were tainted by racism. Assuming Aleuts were of low moral character, government doctors required all females 12 years of age and older to undergo physical examinations for venereal disease. I remember in particular the urgency of once we got there, they had to give us all medical um, treatment of some kind. And my sister, again, being in a certain age group, she was subjected to a physical examinations that were so degrading to her. And we felt really bad about that, but we had no say in the matter. From Wrangell, the Aleuts were moved to more isolated camps. Houses were in pretty bad shape, very bad shape. And they put a whole bunch in a bunkhouse, and that was not good. Families and all, just not good. We had to rebuild, a, they, they supplied the lumber, and we put houses together, built a church, built a school, built some boardwalks, repaired everything. 